chance, you know, to uh, meet someone new or say hi to someone they haven't met before. But um, just so everyone knows why I got the mic on and everything, uh, earlier today our uh, AV equipment did not actually broadcast uh, like we thought. It didn't work out. We didn't really know what was going on. Um, and so what we're going to do now is I'm actually going to be, uh, we're going to film our, our service now. So if, uh, if I'm making gestures to the camera, now you understand why, because that's normally what we do during our second service. So anyways, let's begin with some prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment, for this chance that we get to gather in safety and security, knowing that we get to understand who you are. And so Lord, I ask that this message is coming from you, that this is your word, not my word. I'm just a vessel and we get to experience you in totality because your spirit is involved in all. And so we pray all this. We ask for this blessing upon tonight in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so if you were able, if you were not able to join us last week, we actually began a new message series called Rags to Riches. And we're actually going to be going through kind of what that means, what that is over the next few weeks. It'll all become a lot more clear. But the thing is, as we go week to week, you need to understand that in this type of a message series, each message is built upon the next. All right. So they're found the, each one is a foundation for the next one. They're like building blocks. And so if you missed last week's message, I really want to encourage you that as long as our AV works and everything is on like we want, you know, we hope for it to be, that we get to go back and I encourage you to go back and watch, you know, make time this week to watch the very first message. We talked about a very important topic about being satisfied in the Lord. All right, it's really important to understand that because that's a foundation. Nothing that I talk about, nothing that the Bible talks about will be worth anything in life to you until you understand how to be satisfied in the Lord. Now today, instead of being talking about being satisfied and going into this degree of satisfaction, I want us to, to now know that it, we don't rest there. We don't, that's not the end game, right? So we're going to talk about what it means to go from satisfaction and work from that satisfaction in God's plan. To be satisfied means to be content, but content does not mean complete, Okay? Just because you've learned to be satisfied in the Lord doesn't mean you've reached the end. If you're listening to this message, if you're watching from home, if you're here tonight, if you have to understand that if you're here, you know, if you're on this earth, God's not done with you. You still have a reason. Everything has a reason that it exists. The chairs that you're sitting on exist so that you can rest. You know, this building exists so that it can provide shelter and a place of worship. Everything has a purpose, including you. That purpose, we're going to talk about that as we go into tonight. But the, the, God is not done with you yet. So I want, don't want you to get comfortable in this satisfaction. You need to remember this as we begin. Satisfied does not mean sanctified. If you don't know what the word sanctified means, what it is, is it's the growing process of a Christian's life. To become sanctified is this uh, stage, step-by-step -step process that takes you from spiritual milk to the meat and potatoes and the big beef stew, and right? It gives you real hearty meals. It's sanctification that takes you from one end to the next. It's a process, and it takes effort. Your life, just because you're content with where you are in your spiritual walk does not mean that's where you're supposed to stop. In fact, if you're still here, I know that that's what you're not supposed to stop yet because you're not in heaven. So you're still here, here to be shaped and worked upon, okay? Do you know what your purpose is for every one of us? Do you know what your purpose is here on earth? Have you ever heard that term before, that you have meaning, that you have value, that you have a reason that you exist? If you don't know what it is, Romans chapter 8 verse 29 tells us, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, yeah, I forgot I had slides. Forgot about that. Pressing the button. 
Okay, there we go. There's your first slide. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. If you don't know what that means, it means that your life is to be like Christ's. That's the point. Okay, the word Christian isn't some good term. In fact, the only time we see it in the Bible, it's actually used to make fun of people that were followers of the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. That's what they used to be as members of the way or followers of the way. Christians were, it was a pejorative. It was to make fun of them. Oh, look at those Christians, right? Little Christs. That's what the word Christian means. So when we think about it today and you call yourself one, you say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I'm a Christian, that's my belief system, that's my worldview, then it means that we are to be little replicas of Jesus in the world. That's our job. That's what it means to say that. And you have to think, if that's my, my purpose is to become like Christ, and you know I say I'm a Christian, that I'm in this process of becoming this little Christ in the world, if I am satisfied in the Lord, excuse me, if, if, you, know, you have to ask yourself, if God were to come into this room tonight, if he were to come in here, would he mistake you for his son? Would he look at you and your life and say that this one is holy enough to be my son? If you're anything like me, okay, the answer is probably no. You probably got a lot of things you're working on. A lot of the sin that you're still dealing with, sin that's still kind of shackling your life. But the goal is to go from rags to riches. The rags of sin and the riches of Christ. That's the, that's the whole thing. It's the whole plan and it takes intentionality. Have you ever heard the phrase, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans? You ever heard that before? Well, I want to add to it, okay? If you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. But if you want to hear him cry, don't make any. See, that's big. If you want to hear him cry, don't make any. You have to understand, some of us grew up believing that making plans in light of God, it was futile. It didn't mean anything. It was pointless. But that's just not a biblical perspective. Okay, yes, God is in control. He, he knows how time will end. He is the creator of time. He exists outside of time. He, he has seen both the beginning and the end. He said, I'm the alpha and the omega. He sees all in totality. Right? He's in control. He's got this plan. And he, uh, but God wants you in the process. He wants you to be a, a, not just an, a, an attender of church, okay, but a participator. Somebody who has mission and has meaning in life. He's not going to drag you along like some caveman, but he is inviting you. He's asking you. He's your, you know, his spirit is coming inside of you and saying, come on, let's do this together. I want you to be a part of this. And if you're, if you're misunderstanding this concept of being satisfied in the Lord, that somehow that means that you're done and you don't have to do anything else, or maybe you've put in your time as a Christian and you have no more room to grow, I'm going to tell you right now, the fact that you think that, you've got to really evaluate what you're doing as a Christian, what you, what you mean when you call yourself that. Because change is inevitable. You're going to go through change in life. But what direction or what, cha what you change into depends on which way you're looking, all right? This weather has been amazing. It really has. I, I love cold weather. I love it when it's snowing. I love, uh, you know, with all the rain and everything. And, when, you know, I was driving here and I saw the white capped mountains and they look gorgeous, and then I actually have been thinking over the last few days that once it gets safer to travel up there, I'm going to take the kids. And I've been yearning, just thinking about what it's going to be like to take that first snowball and pelt my son right in the face with it. Right? Like I'm stoked. I'm thinking about just a good time with my kids. And it's, it, it's just really nice. And there was this dad who also uh, one time took his kids up to the snow to have a good time. And, and they were all playing and he had three sons and... If you have kids and you know anything about car rides, what happens is that they will fight over who sits in the front seat. It'll happen every time, okay? So the dad said, all right, now that we're getting ready to go home, 
Let's, uh, let's uh, have a little race to see who gets to ride home. Shotgun. Shotgun is riding in the front seat. And so the, kid, the boy said, of course, I'll, you know, I'll do that. Dad said, all right, it's a race from this side of this field to the other. And the boys were very athletic. So they were like, oh, this is easy. This is easy. I can, I can do this any, you know, with my eyes closed. So dad went on the other side and he counted three, two, one. And all three of them bolted off of the line. But they all did it in unique ways. The first kid, he came off, he came off his little stance and he, um, uh, sorry, let me back up. The dad said, the winner is not the one that makes it here first. The winner is who makes it here to me in a stri- the straightest line. So now there was an added little bit to it. It wasn't just that I got to get there to the end. I got to get there in a straight line. So as the, the, as the boys took off from their stance, the first boy, he took off and he was so concerned about making sure he had a straight walk. He kept his head down and he was watching his feet every step. He watched his feet every step. The brother didn't know anything of which way to go. So he didn't understand what to do. He kind of missed the whole message about running towards dad. And so he was looking at his brother's feet the whole time, kept his head down, looking at his brother, hoping that the brother was running in the right direction. The third brother, however, even though he finished last, when they all turned around, he had the straightest line. And it was because he kept his eyes on the finish line. He kept his eyes on dad. When they turned back, you had the one that was focused so much on each step that they were kind of bobbing and weaving because they couldn't, you know, they didn't have the end goal in sight. So they didn't really know where they were going. The second kid was just hoping that the other one had it right. And it was the third that knew, I have to keep my eyes on the prize. I have to keep my eyes forward. Paul talked about the same thing to the church in Philippi. He said, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In your faith, in your walk, you can either, you know, stare at the ground hoping that you're going the right way. You can spend your life comparing yourself to others or you can look towards the way of Christ. Only one of those is going to lead you to a life of true richness. So if you want to have a life that matters, if you want to have a life that means something in this world, that you are actually participating in God's great plan, that you are actually a part of this, this process, if you want to make plans that matter, plans that lead to a life of true richness, then each one of you in your bulletins, I want you to follow along. There's a little handout that I give every week, and I don't make it just because I'm bored and I want to spend three additional hours putting that together. I, uh, I make it because I want us to follow along. I want us to learn. I want us to be able to refer back to these things, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at James, or excuse me, Jesus' half-brother, James. I don't know if you knew that, but Jesus had half-siblings. They uh, all shared the same mom. They had a different dad, though. Yeah. Cheesy joke for the night. You're welcome. Okay. So anyways, James, in chapter 4 of his letter, he writes, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's a sin for them. That's a lot. And we're going to unpack that tonight. So I want you to follow along. It's a lot to take in. So we're going to look at, you know, at it a little bit closer. And the first thing that I want you to know that in this process and in this season of, of saying, you know, I want to make changes in my life for the better. 
I want to have a better relationship with Christ. I want to have a better relationship with God. I want to be able to understand his word more seriously. I want to learn how to pray better. If you want to do that, if you want to have that kind of a life, number one, he says that life is too short for boring plans. He said, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, why? You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Life is shorter than you think. When I was a teenager, you could ask me, what is going on next week? And I couldn't tell you. I mean, I'm an adult now, and I probably couldn't tell you. But still, when I was a teenager, if you were to ask me what's going on, I'd have no clue. I'd have no idea what was going on. Because it it wasn't just that I didn't know. It was because I didn't care. The way that I thought about tomorrow was, oh, you know, you, you know, I don't have to think about that. I've got my whole life ahead of me. I've got my whole life ahead of me. In like two or three weeks, I'm turning 37. And that whole, it, you know, the, I've realized that the whole life ahead of me thing has an expiration date. It's not so off far in some distant future, okay? The end is real. It is a part of life. It is how life exists, how God planned it, okay? But now I really need to start thinking about my life having, um, living a life that matters, living a life that God wants me to live, not just one I think he wants me to live, but really investing my time trying to discover who he is and what he wants from me. I, you know, I only have so long, so I need to think long and hard about what I want to do while I'm here. Like the psalmist said, for my days vanish like smoke, my bones burn like glowing embers. My days are vanishing just as quickly as they're showing up, and you are not immune to that same process. All of us have to face that. And so when we think about the, the, the change we want to see in this year, we don't want to do it flippantly. We want to do it intentionally. We don't want to do it just kind of willy-nilly. We want to do it that it's going, to be, it's going to be purposeful. It's going to be impactful. It's going to be real. It's going to be something that makes a difference. And so we don't want to be boring with that. We want to be exciting. And James says, you know, uh, he goes on to say, number two, God will provide in the process, but I must plan to perform. In verse 15, James says, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live to do this or do that. If it is the Lord's will should be the the one theological phrase you hold on to for the week. Learn it, memorize it, study it, look in your Bible to see what, what the Lord's will is. It's, a, it's what, the, what Bible scholars, people that study scripture, call in a, in a, in a more um, uh, academic way, God's sovereignty, all right? God's sovereignty is, if, have you ever heard of like a sovereign nation? Sovereign nations have their own power, their own control. They, nothing outside of them tells them what to do. They have their own uh, goals. They have their own desires, their own heart. God is sovereign over all of creation. He's got his plan, his desires, what he wants to see come to fruition. This is total control over over time and space. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out, and here's the thing, everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything goes that God, uh, everything happens the way that God wants it to happen. And I know that that, if you take that to extreme, you know, that can lead to a couple of other questions, and I'm more than happy to discuss that at another time, you know, that, that some of the complications of that, um, uh, that theology. But for now, I want you to understand that God has a plan. Famed uh, preacher Charles Spurgeon said, I believe that every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. That every particle of spray that dashes against the steamboat has its orbit, as well as the sun in the heavens. That the chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as, just as much as the stars are in their courses. 
The creeping of an aphid over the rosebud is just as much fixed as the march of time. The fall of leaves from a poplar is a fully or is fully ordained as the tumbling of an avalanche. You being in this very room, you watching this broadcast, listening to this sermon, is because God has ordained you to experience this moment. This is why we pray that when we come here on weekend services, when we gather together, we don't want to do so just kind of willy-nilly. We want to be intentional. We want to, we want to come here because we know that God has planned us to be here, so we don't want to waste our time. And it's not usually until we look back do we ever see that God has you know, planned our lives or been apparent in different experiences. They say hindsight is twenty twenty. That when we look back, we see the beauty that God is. In the moment, it's kind of difficult, but that's why we're trying to share this. But this creates kind of a pickle for the Christian. If God has already planned everything, why should I do anything? If God has already planned tomorrow, nothing I do today is going to make any difference. If God already has elected all of those from the beginning of time and, and, and you know, they, there's only so many that are going to get into heaven, why in the world would I want to evangelize? Why am I supposed to make disciples? Why am I supposed to be a witness? If God's got a big old plan, what do I have to do with it? Well, let me answer that in the form of a story. There was this young man, or excuse me, this young lady, who brought her fiancé home to see her, or to meet her parents. And during dinner, the dad decided it was time for this obligatory uh, interrogation of the fiancé to see, you know, how good he was for his daughter, to see what he was up to. And anyhow, he said, hey, young man, why don't you join me in the den for a drink? And so after dinner, they, jo- they went in there and dad decided to say, well, what is it that you do? And the young man said, well, I'm a Bible scholar. Okay. A Bible scholar is someone who studies God's word. That's his, they're academics, okay? So the man was like, all right. So how does this biblical scholarship, how does this pay for something like a house for my daughter? Oh, well, I will just make sure to study and God will provide. The dad was thinking, okay, well, how does this studying buy my daughter a ring, an engagement ring that she so deserves. And the fiancé responded, Sir, the study that I do, God will bless it and he will provide. The dad became annoyed because he just keeps getting this same answer and he kind of knows what's going on here. And so the dad said, All right then, what about with children, a family? How do you plan on supporting them? The fiancé kind of smugly looked back, God will provide. This went on and dad eventually entered the conversation and he went out and mom, you know, looked at him and said, well, how did it go? Dad said, the bad news is he's got no job and no future outlooks. The good news is that he thinks I'm God. You can laugh. That is a, this idea that I don't have to do anything. God's going to do everything for me. All right? That's just not how life works. We've always been destined to be participatory in God's creation. Ever since the beginning, okay, we're meant to work. We're, you know, a lot of people think that the reason we have to work and toil and have to go through a lot of these challenges in life is because of sin. No, we've been told to work since the very beginning, before anyone had anything to do with an apple. Okay? Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. There was never a moment in God's plan that you were not destined to be a part of. Actively doing something, playing a part in his big plan. You know, we, we think of this life sometimes and we, we look up at the stars and we look and think about God's great big plan and sometimes we feel insignificant. But trust me, If you were to go to any museum and you look at these grand paintings that look beautiful, they all started with a single brushstroke. Each one, a very small detail in this grand big painting. You are God's paintstrokes. 
each one its own masterpiece that goes into this great, big, beautiful picture of who God is and what he wants. God's will as a whole will make you feel as if you know, you're nothing special, but the more you live up to your purpose in life to become like Christ, the more beautiful you are making the painting of God's story. Now, some of us, when we hear that we're important, that we're extremely valuable, we're grateful. Others, we become very conceited. We think that we're better than other people. We get kind of hoity-toity, right? We start looking down our nose at other people. I'm not saying any of you guys do that, right? It's other churches that do that. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. It was bad for me to say that. But James was very serious when he said, number three, you know, that I must plan but it's always God's glory. He says in verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Boasting means to brag. Bragging is annoying. It is a, it is a habit of some people to just think that, you know, uh, I was hearing a story of another person this afternoon about, I forgot about this kind of a, a, a bragger. You've ever heard of a one-upper? That every time you've got a story, they've got one better than, than you. They're one-uppers, right? These people brag about their lives, even if it's negative. They're just always talking about how good they are, all right? Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. It does not take any research or statistics or a lot of detail to convince you that boasting is a bad attribute in life. You don't want to have that kind of behavior. You don't want to be boasting about yourself. It's annoying, it's rude, and according to James, it's evil. But you need to understand not all boasting is bad, okay? I told you guys a few months ago that I actually started watching football. So I'm actually, I'm, I, I use a lot of football illustrations now. So if you're annoyed by that, I'm sorry. You only have a couple more weeks left and then I'll be over it, Okay. But Saturday, I was watching a football game, and when it, it was a really close game, and in fact, it was the, uh, the team that I'm, that I'm going to talk about, the, at the halftime, they were down by 27 points. It was 27 to zero. And then in the second half, they scored, and they scored, and they kept getting, getting closer to the goal line and getting closer to winning the game, and it came down all the way to the last three seconds of the game. They were in field goal range. All they needed was three points. And to get a field goal and to get those three points, they bring out a kicker, and his job is to kick that little football into those big uprights. That's all he's got to do. And they're in great field position. He comes out there, and they snap the ball. He kicks it. The crowd goes wild. Wow! They win. He gets the field goal. All of a sudden, the team members, they rush around him. They pick him up. They hold him up. And, you know, like he's a hero of the winning the game. And it was such a big moment. And all you could see was this young man pulling his, his uh, cross off of his neck. That As all these cameras are trying to get the close-up shot of him and trying to, you know, show the hero of the game, he's trying to show the hero of mankind. He's putting his cross in the camera's face so that they don't see his, they see Christ. That was impactful to me. It was huge to see that. It was wonderful. Because a lot of times you see athletes, they have some, you know, a home run or they win some trophy and they're always like, you know, give the kiss and point to God, right? They point up to the sky. Thanks, God. That, you know, they do that all the time. There was a Super Bowl that happened, oh, 2010, in a similar situation. And this team was in the Super Bowl, and a kicker came out, made his, made a, uh, had to do a field goal in the first quarter, and he, and he, he did the whole point up to God. Okay, first quarter, he, he, he made the, the field goal. Thanks, God. No one batted an eye because so many athletes do that. It wasn't until the fourth quarter when the game was on the line, and he had to shoot, or he had to make a field goal to win the game, to win the Super Bowl. And when the ball was snapped, he biffed it, and that ball went up a sharp left and missed the field goal. While everyone else had their ha heads held high, the kicker still gave glory to God. He still said, thank you, Lord, for the time that I got to be here, 
for that moment that I'm even in the Super Bowl. Yeah, we may have lost, but look at all the things that we did accomplish. Look at the great things, Lord. Thank you so much for this moment. Thank you even for the failure that now I, I, can, I can practice more and I can learn what's a good way to do things and what's a bad way. Many times in life, it's very easy to boast about God's goodness when things are going well. But the moment that they're not going so good, it's, it's a lot easy, uh, easier for us to give him hell about it. We're like, why would you do this, God? Why are you so, you know, why don't you care for me? I come to church every weekend or I read the Bible every day and I can't believe you would still do something like this to me. What James is saying is that you have to learn how to give God the glory in all things of life. You can't be boasting about yourself. God's plan is the ultimate uh, uh, goal, the ultimate goodness. You have to learn to, if you want to live a rich life, you need to give God the glory in all things. Now, the last thing that uh, James said is in verse 17. He said, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, well, it's a sin for them. I've been telling you tonight that you are to, that in this life, while you're here, your goal is to become a little replica of Jesus in this world. So James says, if you know what you need to do, but you're not doing it, if you're not actively participating, he says, it's a sin for you. Sin is what keeps us from God. It's not some single act. It's this state of being, of not being close to God ever. Sin is what keeps us away. And the more that you make this claim, well, God's got it all, you know, God will provide, and you're not participating, if you're not saying, you know, if you're not making efforts to, to build your, 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 your uh, spiritual life or to foster it, it's a sin. And too many times we look to this world to see, you know, what is the world doing? Maybe that's how I live a rich life. Look at all these other people having a great time, have all the cars or have all the stuff. Let me look towards them. But we don't know it. But they're, they have no idea where they're going. They're staring at their feet one step at a time. They have no direction. And here we are, you know, time after time, looking at others, comparing our lives to them to see if we're going in the right direction, not realizing that those guys are out in la-la land. They've got no idea where they're headed. We look to them and say, oh, man, is that what I'm supposed to be doing in life? Are those the kind of changes I need to make? Is that the person that I need to become? Or do I need to become who God wants me to be? That's my question for you. Who's me am I trying to be? Are you trying to be what someone else wants you to be, or are you trying to be who God wants you to be? Jim Ron said, if you do not take control of your life plan, chances are you're going to fall into someone else's plan. And do you know what they have for you? Not much. God does, though. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. If you want to have a life that's worthy, that's worth anything, if you want to learn what it's like to be rich in Christ, you need to truly look towards the plan of God for your life. Seek his will. Listen for his purpose and his plan and what you have in life. The fastest way that you're going to learn what God wants you to do is by the fastest way you're going to do that, to know what God has planned for you is to embrace your God-given shape. Every one of us have been uniquely made, but we are unified in our purpose. Each one of us, you know, unique, we, we have different skills, we have different spiritual giftings, gift mixes, right? We have different experiences. We, yes, we're all unique. But we all have one great big purpose, and that's to become like Christ. The only way you're going to be able to do that is with the church. They're called the one another's. 
There's, there are commands from Jesus himself, depending on who's counting, right? It's upwards of 50 commands that can only be accomplished within a church family. I hate to say this, but to tell others that you love Jesus and you are not loving his church, you, you, you've got it twisted. You've got it completely backwards. You misunderstand what it means to replicate Christ's love. We all have a purpose. The church is where we start to learn that purpose because people come here to, to, to help us bear our burdens. We meet others and make connections and we learn what care is and community and compassion. We all have a unique stance and a unique brushstroke in God's big picture. I need you to understand that not just me, of course it's cliche from a pastor you know, to say something like this, but you, you, you discover what your design is and your purpose in God's great picture by making a commitment to God and yourself that you will make your church family a priority. Okay? You need to make, first thing you need to do is make weekend worship a priority in life. It's not just some you know, thing coming from a pastor because I'd like to see butts in the seats. That's not what this is about. This is something bigger than that. This is about something that's going to outlast your time at Rocky Hill. Making God's, you know, making God's uh, um, family a priority is huge. It's for your life. Every week people set aside to watch their favorite shows, their TV shows. Every week, people set aside time, especially during football season. Oh, I can't go to church. Kickoffs at 1030, right? They do it all the time. They set aside time for what's important to them. They set aside time for, you know, going and eating at different, you know, special places. Think about if you have a spouse, if you have a significant other. If you only spent, you know, one or two times a, a month with them, would you really get a chance to know them? Would you know much about them? 60 years ago, regular attendance to a church was once a week. Now, every poll out there says regular attend people call themselves members of a church, regular attenders, followers of Christ by attending weekend worship two times a month. And that's being generous. Usually it's about once. You will never know if you are the reason somebody comes back to church. Your smile, your hug, your hey, how you doing? Your embrace. You'll never know if you're the reason, but that person needs you. You may say, ah, oh, I don't need the church. I'm going to tell you right now, the church needs you. The church totally needs you. Need your, need your, your giftings, need your strengths, need your weaknesses to help flesh out what you know, God has been trying to, to build in us. Second thing is to connect yourself to others in the church. Right now is a great time for you to really think about getting involved in a connect group. I talk about them frequently. And the reason is, is because I really want to make sure as your pastor, I'm giving you opportunities to understand how to become like Christ. And you're really only going to understand that being around people who are non-Christ-like. You get me? That's what connect groups are all about. Connecting with God and with others. That's the point. And it's been scary for a lot of people. They don't want to get involved. Maybe you don't know someone or you feel like it's going to be a stretch for you or you've never done anything like that before. So we made it really easy. No preparation, okay? There's nothing you have to study. You don't have to be some knowledgeable person. All you gotta do is show up to Sundays. That's your preparation. We're gonna be starting groups that just extend the weekend message where you talk about it with others, how you can apply it through the week and really get to know each other. In your bulletins, I put in a little uh, half sheet. On one side of that half sheet, it says, I Want to, I want to join a connect group. My goal for 2023 is to have every single person of our church in one of these small groups. If that happened, imagine what Exeter would be like. Imagine what Woodlake would be like. 
or Visalia or Tulare. Imagine what your community, your workplace, your family would be like if people were truly, weakly learning how to love God. It would change everything. To truly be little imitators of Christ, little Christs in our community. Maybe you've been a part of a small group. Maybe you've had that experience knowing how important it is to your life. Maybe this is the season, the chance for you to start one yourself. It's not a big deal. We're making it easy. No prep. Don't have to do anything. All you got to do is show up. Make sure everybody has a good time. That's it. It doesn't even have to be that great of a time. Just at least say hi to each other. Build that relationship. It takes a step of faith. I know that. But on the other side of that form, it says, I want to host a group. If you believe that God has been leading you to take a step of faith, to make, you know, take that first step towards that race that you're running, and it's leading you out of sight of your comfort zone, if God has been telling you, you need to take a step, maybe this is the one. So that you can learn how to work out what God's been working in your soul, working in your life. Don't push it off. You need to make a commitment this Sunday, not someday. Someday I'll do that. Someday I'll get involved. Someday I'll I'll learn how God wants me to help other people. Someday I'll serve at the church. No, you need to make a commitment now or it'll never happen. This is your year to experience God like you've never experienced him before. All you have to do is begin. Begin. You don't have, you're not going to be exactly who God wants you to be right in the beginning. It's a process. But it takes a first step. And so he's inviting you to take that step tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It is always sufficient. It is always good for correction and guidance it is always good to, to uplift our souls and to, and to uh, refresh our spirits. So we thank you for your goodness, even if it means that we need to make some changes in who we are and what we thought, what we thought were, was important in life. Lord, many of us have been on the, on the struggle bus for a long time. We want to make, you know, changes, good changes. We want to become more like you, but it seems like we hit a roadblock or an obstacle time after time. Lord, I ask for your, uh, your spiritual illumination to guide each and every one of us to the step that we need to take to respond to your word. Maybe it's to lead a group. Maybe it's to join one for the very first time. Maybe, maybe it's just to, 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 to make weekend worship a priority in life. Maybe it's to make you a priority for the very first time. Lord, whatever it is, we know that it's the Holy Spirit that guides all of those decisions. Though we may trust you, we need you to remove our doubt that you will provide Because we want to move. We want to perform. We want to be involved and participate in your great plan. So we need your strength in order to make that happen. We need your courage to step out of our comfort zone. We need you. Because none of this will happen without you. I want to pause in this prayer. And if you are here tonight and you're not sure if you truly have, have, have yourself settled with, with Jesus, that, that you know that you're a part of his plan, all I need you to do is just follow along with me. Lord, I don't have all the details understood or figured out, but what I do know is that I need to turn away from who I once was so that I can become who you want me to be. This means that I need to repent of my sin and accept your spirit as my spirit so that I can turn towards you and I can live a new life, one that is made for good, one that is made for eternity. 
If you followed along with me, you didn't have to say the exact words. What you had to, to confess is that you need Jesus because without him, you are separated for eternity. If you accepted Christ tonight, just tell somebody around you. You don't have to, you know, make a big deal out of it. Trust me, the angels in heaven are making a big enough deal as it is. But we want to help you grow. That's what the church is here for. Lord, for all of us, though, here tonight, as we continue to hear this final song, we ask that your spirit cause a response in our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We offer this time to you. Bless this in your name. My prayer for you this week is that you learn to ha uh, offer yourself to the Lord daily. Each day saying, Lord, have your way with me. Let me be a part of your great plan. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. What a blessing it has been to experience you again. As we leave from here, I ask for your protection, your safety. And uh, Lord, we ask that uh, as we prepare our weeks, we prepare them thinking of you. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. All right, guys, I'll see you next week as we continue our series in Rags to Riches.